Hello, everyone. Welcome to our facet, Art and Power. It is so good to see you all. I'm going to um, go over what we're going to need today. I just wanted to show you visually since a lot of us are, are more visually inclined. So here is what you'll need. I'm going to move my camera to the one that points down on my document camera and we'll go over this really quickly. I do want to say that throughout our time together today, you are free to move about the cabin. You have freedom to stand up, go get stuff. If you're like, oh, I need some water, um, just go ahead and do that. You're, you know, if you're like, if God gives you an idea for grabbing a different supply, you can do that too. That way we can all be free to dive deep into the visuals and into scripture. Okay, so um, the first thing we'll do is I'm going to show you what to have on hand so that when it's time to do um, to get into our material, we're not still, you know, frazzled or wondering what it is we're going to use. So um, let me show you first and then I will say a little prayer for all of us so that God can guide us in this process. The first thing you're going to need is some kind of a support to put your collage on when it's time. Cardboard for, all you need is one. These are just examples. Just grab one thing. Um, even a, a notebook, like the back of a notebook works really nicely because it's so thick, you know, and it doesn't bend very well. Um, it's okay if it's got a little bend to it also. This is some, I don't know, some scrap paper kind of called to me. So I'll probably choose one of these. I don't know which one yet. So that's your support. That's just what you'll be um, collaging onto. Uh, another thing you'll have on hand is just a regular old pencil. Um, so that's pretty simple. And some other things that you might want is either some plain paper. It doesn't have to be colorful, it can be. Um, if you use white paper or light toned paper, then you can use some colored pencils or a watercolor set, anything to add color. Um, if you are feeling led to use color, you don't have to use color. You can do this entirely grayscale if that's what you're seeing. If you're using paint, then of course, you'll want a brush or two. So I've got like a little wider of a brush and then I've got a little smaller brush. That's if you're using paint. Another thing that you could use is a magazine if you want. Feel free to ignore everything I'm saying, <laughs> like do whatever God wants you to do. So, um, so here's some magazine images that I tore out of a Better Homes and Garden. This one has some kind of interesting texture on it. It's a sofa. This is a photograph of a close-up of a sofa and it's got like some grain to it, like the fabric. But I thought it might be a nice, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to make yet. I'm going to listen to the scripture and see what that is. But, um, you know, here's another one with a pattern of some kind of snowflakes or flowers or something. Could become something. And this one, I don't know if I'm going to actually use it. I just ripped it out as an example of collage from a magazine that I just had sitting around. Uh, other things you might want to embed into your collages you know just some string or you know you could find something that makes an interesting texture kind of to stamp into things if you're using paint you could use that or glue um, I suppose to make all these things stick on we should probably use some glue so I've got some glue here um, I got a glue stick and also just some like kids craft glue and that's pretty much all I have the other thing that I recommended is a found object. And so I don't know if you know what a found object is, but it's just something that you happen to find around your house, around your yard. 
Maybe you found an interesting object at work. So it could be um, that you shift gears and say, okay, I thought I was going to use that. But now the Lord is bringing this other object to mind that I think I saw sitting on my bathroom windowsill or something. So just a little thing. It could be a, a paper clip or a thumbtack or um, a feather or, you know, a leaf that had fallen off a plant or something. So um, we're just going to remain open today and see what the Lord brings to mind as we are creating our expression through visual art today so with that um like i said feel free to stand up and walk around and grab something if you forgot usually what i tend to do is i have two containers of water if i'm going to be using paint which i might today i don't know might use my watercolors um the one that is like this container that's white or clear, usually I reserve that for my clean water to dip into. Like if I want to bring over some clean water to water something down in my art. And then I have another cup that's strictly for dirty water paint to plunge a brush into that gets really, really dark. And I don't have to stand up and change it because I have this one to dip into if I need clean water. That's usually what I tend to do for stuff. But no worries if you just have one container, that's fine because you can change it anytime you want. So I'm going to open with some prayer and then we'll get going on our Visio Divina today. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us together today in community, for creating this media of, um, of art, the visual art, visual objects, real life tangible things that we can touch and move around and that that can say something profound god and we're not manufacturing anything lord and that's the theme for today even though you, we're using our hands um this is this is you that we are attuned to so thank you for being among us thank you for inhabiting our imaginations. And I bless each and every person here today, and that's watching this later, that you will meet each person right where they are. Everything that we do today would be to your glory. Thank you, Lord, for being beauty and for inviting us into it. We just want to play with you today with no thought to what we're actually going to be creating. We just want, um, we just want you. We just wanna be close to you. So if anybody has a little bit of nerves or fluttering, Lord, I ask that you would calm that down and that you would bring each person peace. And that this is not about the results and let each person know that this is really about the heart. This is really about just you and them. And it is really only for you and them. And they don't even have to share it, God. Just help them to allow you to move in the process. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. All right. Now I'm going to show you a special little treat from my friend Manuel Luz. Some of you will recognize this since you took the Foundations of Art Ministry course. Others of you, this will be a sneak peek into part of the art ministry course that we teach. Um, this is from lesson four called Transcendence and Beauty. And a lot of you have told me this is your, one of your favorite lessons. <laughs> I have to agree, it's amazing. So I'm gonna share my screen and we're just, and you can feel free while this is going to sketch, doodle, write down stuff, stuff, or just let the words wash over you. If you, um, if you would like, you can already begin um, some kind of a collage if you want to, even though we're not really getting there yet. That's going to be like the third thing that we do, okay? So if you prefer, you can just wait for the collage. If you're like, I just really want to make something, then feel free, please. 
Um, and you can always doodle on a scrap piece of paper as well. All right, so I'm leaving this. There should be a lot of freedom in art. <laughs> I really firmly believe that. And I also know that it doesn't do a whole lot of good to tell artists what to do. So um, yeah, <laughs> know your audience. <laughs> so anyway, have a lot of freedom. And I really hope you enjoy this message from my friend Manuel Luz. And we have no idea why. It's some transcendent, hopefully, experience that is created um, that has nothing to do with who we are and what we've done. We can't manufacture it. It just happens. And that's what transcendence is. Now, as it relates to God, the word transcendence is a theological term. Transcendence refers to the relationship of God to his creation. God is other. He is different from his creation. He's independent from his creatures. He transcends creation. He's beyond it and not limited by it. When we use the term uh, transcendence in connection with God, we're acknowledging and recognizing that he is completely beyond what we can imagine, understand, or comprehend. Isaiah 55 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so you, my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's thoughts, powers, ways, wisdom, faithfulness, justice, love, transcends us. So that's a theological understanding of God's transcendent nature, but what does transcendence have to do with us? Well, I'd like to believe that we, as human beings, long for transcendence, for experiences that take us beyond the mere material world. We thirst for things beyond this earthly plane, love, vision, something greater than ourselves. We're made this way. I think this is actually one of the evidences of God. God made us with this compass in our souls. And the magnet in this compass always points true north. We long for goodness and truth and beauty. And ultimately, what we long for is a transcendent experience relationship with the one true God. Psalm 84 says, how lovely is your dwelling place, Lord God Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. This psalm doesn't just refer to a, a physical earthly place, but more so the transcendent state of God's dwelling, to be in God's supernatural presence. We're made in the image of God, and there's a part of us that may seem more at home when we are present in the supernatural world, the world unseen. I'd actually say that as we mature in Christ, being present in transcendence should become more and more familiar to us. Transcendence should be normative to the Christ follower. Transcendence should be normative for the artist of faith. So let's talk about art for a second. The arts pull back the curtain, offer a different point of view, allow us to entertain the idea that there's more to life than meets the eye. Art is that voice outside of Babel that tugs at the hearts beyond mere color. Art is by nature transcendent because it pokes at the things that are beyond mere human rationale or reason. When we paint or write poetry or sing songs, or photograph the sunset, we're attempting to speak of things that are beyond our grasp. You ever think about how art works? Let me take you through this a little bit. Imagine the beauty of a starry night sky. It stretches out before us like this velvety blanket, shimmering with lights like diamonds. Truly, it's a beautiful and remarkable thing. And simply through its existence, it breathes a hallelujah to God. In fact, our God, the creator, the artist God, takes great pleasure in the creation of all things. From this starry night sky to the world around us and even the super, supernatural world that we do not see. Revelation 4.11 says, For thy pleasure they are and were created. And Genesis 1 says, God um, willed all that he had made and it was very good. And I'm sorry, saw that he, all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. 
I sometimes get the sense that God was laughing in delight as he made the universe. For our God is an eternally joyful God. And our God not only receives pleasure in the act of creation, he also receives glory because the beauty of his creation perfectly reflects his original intention for the universe. In other words, it perfectly reflects his nature, his aesthetic, his glory. Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech, night after night they display knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Well, how does a starry night proclaim the glory of God Almighty? Well, in part because he made us in his image, and one of the aspects of being made in the image of God is that he gave us this inborn aesthetic. God integrated something deep into our souls, some mysterious aesthetic that responds to beauty. God designed beauty, defined beauty, and then designed us to respond to beauty. Romans 1.20 says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Because of this, I think we respond to things that are beautiful, like that compass that we talked about, the compass that's pointing north. So the vast and dark beauty of a starry midnight sky exists to display God's glory. And we respond, we're drawn to we are uniquely and universally um, designed, because we're humans, to do so, whether we are Christ followers or not. Now, let me get back to the art for the second. Someone can take a photograph of that starry night sky. And we all know that the photograph of the night sky is not the night sky. It's only a piece of paper or an image on a computer screen. But if it is photographed well, then the photo hints of the sky and displays its beauty and majesty interpreted through the eyes of the person who took that photo, through the eyes of the artist. So we suspend our disbelief that this is simply a piece of paper and enter into an experience of that night sky through the photograph. What happens then is called art. Because we suspend our disbelief, we can see the photo also with the same eyes that saw the night sky as a beautiful and remarkable thing. I really like the way that he puts that. Um, the, the transcendence that God has designed in beauty is, um, is such a, a beautiful way of experiencing God. Um, I wanna read something to you from another person who practices Visio Divina. People have been conditioned to say, what does this thing mean? Give me a bullet point. And that's the wrong way to approach Christ and church and art and prayer. I'm gonna repeat that part. What does this thing mean? Give me a bullet point. It's the wrong way to approach Christ, churches, art and prayer. If you expect to only get one thing out of prayer, one time on the first go, then that's, that's just a really, a very stunted way of experiencing all that God has. Um, the quote continues, I think we have to reclaim in a certain way that prayer is not just about talking or even about listening in a verbal way through our left hemisphere. <laughs> but also being touched by something really beautiful and not having the words to describe it and being very moved or grateful to God and feeling very close to God. So I, I think that's a beautiful way of looking at it. Um, so we're going to do a little bit of practice now before we do our collage. Um, if you've already started on, on your collage, I encourage you to hit, hit pause in your art making for just a minute. You know how um, the Bible says that the word is active and living? Um, so this is an example of, if you look at an image today, 
it's not necessarily the same takeaway as you would if you had looked at it last week or tomorrow. So we're just going to allow the Lord to minister to us in this image, and I'll share my screen. Um, also, side note, before I show this, if there is something that you have at your disposal in your surroundings, maybe it's a piece of art on your wall that you've looked at a thousand times and, and you know what it is of, but the Lord is drawing your eye to that in this exercise, use that instead. Okay? It could be in your surroundings, something on your wall, an image in a magazine that you were paging through earlier. So if that's the one God is drawing your attention to through this exercise, get that instead of what I'm going to show on your screen. Okay? So we're just going to ask the Lord right now through some quiet time um, for him to meet us right where we're at, right where we are. If you would just ask God to show one of these images that he's drawing your attention to, not all of them, but one of them. And now we're going to close our eyes and sort of push preconceptions away. So I just invite you to close your eyes and sort of a cleansing of the palate. Lord, I ask that you would meet each person and guide them to the specific image that you want to show them something about yourself through this piece of art. And feel free to open your eyes at any time again and let your gaze rest on something. It doesn't have to be something you like. It could be something that even brings you discomfort. And we're going to spend a minute and look deeply. And I'm going to stop talking for you. <laughs> um, we're going to spend literally one minute looking deeply. And now we're going to spend one more minute looking at the same image that God already shows you, whether it's on this screen or somewhere in your surroundings. I'm going to spend one minute looking prayerfully at the same image.
As the last part of this exercise, we're going to spend about two minutes listening prayerfully. We've looked prayerfully. We've looked deeply before that. Now we're listening prayerfully, looking at the same image that we've been looking at. If anybody would like to, you can take a quick picture of the one you were looking at. I know it'll be all pixelated and screen with this screen stuff on it, but uh, would anybody like to share what the Lord showed you or brought you through or said anything new um, about his nature or anything like that? Because I think. This can be a very profoundly personal experience. And so maybe not a one of you wants to share, and that is okay. Um, if you would like to share, then you, I welcome you to unmute yourself um, for a minute, and we can give a, a couple minutes for this. But please don't have any pressure, because this is truly meant to be between you and God. But also, if you want to share, you're definitely welcome to. I think I will start, and maybe I'll be the only one, and that's okay. Um, God drew my eye to the, uh, the crosswalk with the um, overhead view of people. And in that view, I was... The first step was to look deeply. And so I was looking at all the people and their shadows and their clothing. And, and then when I was looking prayerfully, I noticed that the one in the red stood out to me. And to the right of that person is another person. They're both not on the crosswalk while everybody else is. And then the Lord kind of nudged me in the direction of uh, going after the one, leaving the 99 and going after the one. 
who in my imagination is the one with the red coat. And when I was listening prayerfully, God like, he flipped it. It became a three-dimensional um, a three-dimensional scene instead of a two-dimensional overhead scene so that they were on a mountain. The two are on the mountain. And then the 99 who are on the crosswalks are just fine. They're okay. It's okay to walk away and, and leave them for a bit in the pursuit of the one who is wearing red. <laughs> That's what the Lord was showing to me. I'm getting a little emotional. <laughs> um, and it's going to be different for every person. If somebody else saw the same one that they were drawn to, it's going to be very personalized for you. <laughs> I'll leave this screen up so we can see which one. If you would start by saying which one that God drew your gaze to. So he drew my gaze to the rocks, the stones. First thing that stood out to me was how unique each one is in shape and color. And then, you know, as I prayed more about it, they became more like I can almost grab them, you know, more dimensional and stuff. And so what that means to me is sometimes you meet a person or a situation and you don't really see it wholly, completely. Um, you know, so so then as you take the time to pray about it and look at it, you get a little bit more into depth of that person or thing that you're looking at and then last of all what really stood out was the top one that looks like a heart to me because uh, he was talking about the heart and the soul compass and all that kind of stuff and so that one it's black and white in my in my sight anyways I don't know how good my sight is but it's black and white it's to me it's saying it's really just all that simple you just got to love each other that's what it says hmm. Lovely, lovely. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. All right. Who else would like to share? The image that I was drawn to is uh, the same as Jesse's, the crosswalk. Uh, the interpretation of, of what I got out of it is quite different and uh, indeed very, very personal. Mm. Um. My notion uh, was that God is calling me, and I know exactly what to, uh, he's calling me to uh, take a step into the deep unknown um, for art ministry. And I have registered for your course, um, Jesse, in January. So he's calling me. And he is taking me into the center. That square in the middle is where that's what he has for me. I, however, am one of those people on the bottom triangle, the person that's outside of the crosswalk. I am there and I am looking and I am sniffing and I am curious and all of that. And God is saying, I am calling you and I would like you to step in right into the center. And, um, and so, and so I am doing that, but it, it is a process and it's, it's, I got super emotional Um because God is speaking to me directly, and I cannot believe that he's calling me. Um, I'm just so, so grateful. And I have a bunch of words. I sketched that because I will do something with that image. Uh, it's so powerful uh, mm. for me uh, in this day. So, oh my goodness. Wow. So thankful that I am here live. Yes. Yes, me too. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing, mm. Michelle. Mm. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Lovely group. Well, I'm going to replace the spotlight with Diane now. Hi, everybody. Hi, Diane. Um, I was drawn to the blue. On the looking deeply, uh, I 
was drawn to um, like this center in the angle. And I, but in the background, and I saw the background, I, I'd actually had leaned back in my chair and was looking at it. And even though you said to look deeply, which would normally make me look closer. And I just heard the words distant, blue, bruised, shattered markings. Those are things coming up from inside me. Um, looking prayerfully, the shift of, because um, God's good. I saw the more the color of the lighter blue and just the covering of the shadows of the grays and neutrals that were in the back room, like an overshadowing. And then listening prayerfully, um, I heard the word marked, uh, light breaking through and the word hope. And um, so I thought, I felt like I was to look up like uh, the meaning of the color blue in the Bible and it represents heaven and God's word. And then it said Exodus 24, 10, which I haven't read that yet, but it said also the healing power of God. And so it seems quite appropriate <laughs> right now for yeah. the se season I'm in. That's beautiful. <laughs> beautiful, Diane. Thank you so much for sharing with, with us. I think it was maybe Sally. Okay, Sally. I picked the crosswalks as well. And um, again, totally individual, <laughs> different than what's been spoken. Um, I was uh, attracted by the patterns. And um, as I just focused on it and listened, the black shapes are what I was drawn to. And the bottom one being the, the tri triangle and the triune God and me being the square. And I'm standing on a very tippy edge, <laughs> but held in place by all the different patterns and directions the Lord's going to show me. Um, and the word ambiguity then coming back to me several times lately it's okay to be in that ambiguous place it's stable and secure and my place right now is in that freedom to be in the ambiguous place uh tipping is standing on my <laughs> that little point mm -hmm. and um uh, and not fearing just knowing that um, that's where I'm supposed to be and God's holding me straight up. That is amazing, Sally. Thank you for sharing. I hope that you do cherish in your heart the things that the Lord showed you through this exercise. Um, and what I will say, um, I'm shifting into art ministry mode now. Um, for those of you, it's not everybody, but for those of you who want to facilitate such a thing um, anytime, whether it's soon or much later, uh, I like to give a little bit of um, coaching on how to present this with other people. Um, I would do some research on Visio Divina, see what you want to read about, see what you want to include, what you want to leave out and cater it um, to the experience of your particular gathering, whether it's three people or 30 people, whether they're men and women or just women or whatever the situation is, you know, their ages. Um, so uh, prayerfully you're preparing um, and definitely don't leave scripture out of it. Um, this is something that, you know, can tend to toe the line toward other practices that are outside of Christianity. And so you want to have a very firm undergirding of scripture, not just to, you know, delight our fancy and justify what we're doing. It's actually the nature of God to be transcendent and his essence is beauty. And so, you know, backing this up with the word of God 
is so important. Why? Not to justify ourselves. It's to crumble down any walls that might hinder what the Lord wants to do in your gathering, where two or more are gathered, there Jesus is, right? So if they're coming in with all of these arguments of, well, no, that's not a tradition I'm aware, you know, that I'm familiar with, or, well, no, I don't trust that because that derives out of this tradition or this, you know, um, historic, historical use or sounds fishy to me. I don't trust it. That is why scripture is so necessary and the gentleness of the way that God designed the world, um, not just the world, but everywhere like we saw the stars um and beauty is everywhere and so anyway if you're presenting visio divina or something similar um make sure you you walk into it with enough of an introduction so that people's walls are sufficiently down and people and the lord can move you know where where there's a lot of doubt and hesitancy i mean jesus even said he couldn't do a lot of miracles in um, towns that had a lot of, you know, doubt <laughs> and skepticism. And so to present it in a way that um, as much as possible, you're not responsible for their doubt, by the way, or the things that might erode what the Lord wants to do. You're not responsible for that either. But it is nice to introduce. Um, and then the, the three steps that I took you through, which isn't the only way to do this, was um, you might want to jot it down if you're interested in doing this yourself. Um, look deeply. Look prayerfully. Listen prayerfully. So photographs, paintings, sculptures, you know, anything can do this. Um, and usually I use a finished piece of art. Uh, and I blogged about this too. You'll find it on godlovesart.com. One night I was doing this at my local art ministry and I forgot all my photo references. I forgot all my art references that I was going to hand out to people. And I was like, uh, whoops. And um, we ended up just looking up at the walls at the existing art that our own local artists had doodled and drawn and painted. God blew everybody away. So yeah, it's an amazing practice. Um, and if you have any questions about it in particular after today, you can always feel free to email me too, because I like questions. Questions are awesome. Okay, we're going to move on to our collage now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a passage of scripture. You're not going to finish it in this setting, in this time, in this little little glimpse of time that we have with one another here online you're going to finish it you're going to start it you might finish it um if it's very simple or if you if the lord gives you something like super fast but don't rush you know this could this could morph over days or weeks for you so i just want to say that right out the beginning there is no pressure to finish anything it could be in process for a long time an undetermined amount of time. Maybe the Lord wants it to just be in process and not be finished. That's okay too. Um, if you are using cardboard or something like that, later on, if you are wanting to put it up vertically somewhere, binder clips work really well for like putting it up somewhere on a, on a nail or a, th a thumbtack. Um, but that's just a, just an idea. Um, so I'm going to read a passage of scripture. And the first time that we, that we read it, I'm actually going to have you take your pencil and a scrap piece of paper and jot down little tiny phrases that come to your mind. Uh, I don't want you to jot, jot down everything like you're taking notes because there's not a quiz on this passage of scripture or what I read. Um, this is the things that God shows you, illuminates to you, makes it kind of stand out, puts a little bit of a glow around a certain word. <laughs> so for those kinds of things, if the Lord is kind of tapping your shoulder and say, hey, here's a phrase that's kind of interesting, don't you think? Even if you've heard this before, don't you think that's an interesting phrase? Um, don't question why yet. 
just jot it down and then move on. Okay. So I'm going to be reading something aloud. And our passage of scripture today is, it's found in um, partly in John 7 and partly in John 8. Okay. Um, so I'm going to read this story um, about the main story actually here is Jesus encountering the woman who was caught in adultery. But I'm going to set the stage for this by reading just a little before that in chapter seven. You can jot this down on your notes too, if you'd like, before I begin to read. Um, starting with John 7, 37 through 39. It's just a little setup because it sort of goes into the next day. And I think context is important when looking at scripture. So again, that was John 7, 37 through 39. And I will also be reading John chapter 8, 1 through 11, okay? All righty, here we go. Um, as I read, just feel free to jot down. Now, the first reading of this, this is Lectio Divina. This is the reading of scripture three times through. In this day and age, we're used to just kind of instantaneous everything. So if you find your thoughts wandering, if something suddenly comes to your mind that you forgot to take care of or something, something's trying to distract you. If it helps, jot it down on your scrap piece of paper also and be like, I'll deal with you later, little idea. <laughs> okay, so no judgment, just jot the phrase down and go, okay, I don't have to try to remember you. And then re-engage with the scripture. So upon this first reading, we're listening for context, who is doing what and where, and what the surroundings might look like and feel like. Kind of the physical setting and who is doing what. All right. So I'm going to start with the context. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not yet been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Then they all went home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against Jesus. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. This is the reading of God's word.
the second reading. We are listening. We are listening prayerfully. Okay, so this is if God wants to bring out anything again. And he might show you something deeper. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this, he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not yet been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Then they all went home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in their midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on sin no more. This is the reading of God's word. Upon the third reading, we're going to listen visually. You can think about color, texture, space, spatial relationships in the story. You can think about line. You can think about repetition. And if anything jumps out at you, you can jot it down or just imagine it. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the spirit, whom to those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Then they all went home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. 
Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his fingers on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more, he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on sin no more. This is God's word. Lord, I pray for your perfect peace to fall upon us in our imperfect process. And I pray that we would be able to focus on you in the creation of what it is that we're imagining with you. And now I'm going to turn on a little bit of music and you can collage. And if you need a little bit of a start, sometimes it helps me to literally close my eyes and make some kind of a mark on my paper. Like I'll draw two lines across my whole paper, a straight line from side to side, and then a curvy line from side to side just intersecting or not intersecting, just something, something to start. If you're stuck, make a couple of random lines and then go forward with that. Maybe color one of them in and see where it takes you. This is a very responsive act. It's not like a, I'm seeing the whole composition finished. That's not what we're doing. We're just responding little by little, step by step, just like our journey with the Lord. So don't try to make a masterpiece. This is just simple glued paper onto a piece of paper, okay? Or cardboard. As simple as you can using the elements of design, but not worrying about what it's going to end up looking like. Right? All right, I'm going to start our music now and we're just going to create with the Lord.
I hope the Lord has really blessed you in this time together. Um, tomorrow, we will be um, having author Andy Crouch, who was the um, executive editor of Christianity Today for five years. Um, he uh, has written a number of books, including Playing God and Culture Making. Um, he has very much influenced and shaped how, um, how I engage with the people around me in art ministry. So that will be tomorrow, uh, along with a few stories of art ministry and amazing things that the Lord has done. When we first uh, start our call tomorrow, um, I'm going to be brave and ask if anybody wants to share. I will be sharing my design that I, I'm making right now. Um, and if anybody else wants to, um, you can also pitch in and, and, and pipe up and I'll, and we'll unmute you and you can share, you know, the, the process of what you've made. You don't have to, <laughs> this is a very personal private thing. It can be. Um, and so if I'm the only one who shares tomorrow, that's okay. I don't mind that at all, but I do want to give the opportunity in case anybody else wants to join me in sharing what God showed you. Like I said, you can share it even if it's still in process. You don't have to have been finished. So I'm going to share mine tomorrow, whether I finish it or not. Um, yeah, um, we're also going to be talking tomorrow with, with Andy Crouch about the power that God has given you um, just as somebody who is filled with the Holy Spirit. So um, and ways to build bridges in your community by utilizing that power that God has put into you. So I'm really looking forward to that live tomorrow. On Friday, I'm going to be teaching a master class, which will involve personal prayer art. If you've ever heard of that, it is the process of sitting down with another person, um, either digitally, like long distance, or right in person, right in front of you, and asking the Lord to share with that person a simple word or image that the Lord wants to convey to that person in this, either in this stage of their life, or maybe it's for later, because we've had it happen where somebody opens a, a random book and then out falls a simple little drawing that they received from somebody through personal prayer art a year or two before, but right now it means something to that person at this stage in their life. How random, not really, <laughs> it is by design. Um, and so we're going to talk Friday, that's going to be Friday, uh, about the power of art in local art ministry. Um, and we're going to also be talking Friday about the difference between global and local and how to figure out if you're, the, you know, if you're doing art ministry either later or soon, um, how to figure out if it is local or if it is global. So, yeah. Um, I'm really excited about Friday and the way that God is going to meet us, not just for our own benefit, but for the benefit of so many others. Alrighty. So I will see you back at the same Zoom link tomorrow at the same time that you entered today. And I know that we had somebody join us in Germany today. Thank you for joining us, Connie. Um, and uh, we'll see who joins us tomorrow and Friday too. Alrighty. God bless you. And thank you so much. Bye-bye.